Welcome to the Jerusalem Lights podcast with Rabbi Chaim Richman, whose goal is Torah for everyone. I'm your co-host, Jim Long, and now Rabbi Chaim Richman. Shalom and Chodesh Tov. Welcome to the wonderful, watery world. Shalom, Rabbi. This is our, our brand new month that we are beginning today, Rosh Chodesh, and it is called Mar Cheshvan, which is the, the official name. And of course, the the uh, word Mar actually means bitter, and it also means Mister, which kind of kind of um, foreshadows the idea that this this month it's kind of like um, formal. It's like it's not. It's not like a, uh, we don't feel about it uh, that it is like um, a warm embrace like Tishrei was. It's a, it's an interesting month because especially coming right after Tishrei, Tishrei last month was so full of action. You know, it was very high profile. We had all these action oriented commandments. We had the shofar and we had the four species and the sukkah and we danced with Torah and, and Simchat Torah. And then we come into this month right after Tishrei. And it's actually kind of drab. It's kind of like a, a fitting introduction to the trees leaving, losing their leaves, and it's getting cold, and winter is coming in, and the and the whole rush of adrenaline that we had in in Tishrei. Because now, this is actually the only month on the entire Hebrew calendar that doesn't have any sort of holiday, not even a fast day. The rainy season begins in Eretz Israel, which is quite appropriate. Right. And of course, our our um, conception, our our take on rain here in the Holy Land is we love it, you know, because it 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 is a blessing. It is anyway all throughout Torah, rain is always synonymous with with Hashem's will being fulfilled. You know, <clears throat> as we say in in the Shema, you know, Hashem says if we if we we'll keep his his mitzvot, if we keep his commandments, then we get rain at the appointed time. It's always synonymous with with faith mm-hmm. and with um, Hashem's blessing. Which also is is um, how should we say it? It's it it's not not irony, but it it's it has this sense of um, dichotomy. The whole concept of of water, because it's also this is the month of the flood. This month of Cheshvan. This week, of course, the Torah reading this week is Parshat Noach. It's the time of the great flood and the time of Noach. And that in itself is hard enough to understand because it was only 10 generations that progressed from Adam to Noah. And yet Hashem already decided about that world, which last week he said was so good. He looked at every part of creation. Behold, it was very good. And now he's like, as it were, so disappointed that he he decided to destroy all life on on earth, with the exception of, of the righteous Noah and those with him on the ark. And that was on the 17th day of this month of Mar Hashvan, that the flood began. Yeah. So this all comes together in a, in a very, very amazing way because the, the idea is that, for, first of all, we really have to understand what the world was like, what was going on in that generation. Before we begin to understand why, why did Hashem decide to destroy the world through water, which actually in, in this week's video, I, I hope to go into in a, in a completely new level of, of depth of, of what that's really all about, you know, how water, which is the very essence of emunah, of faith in Hashem, and reward can also be used by Hashem as, as the instrument of, of retribution, why that's so. But listen, the, our sages talk about who Noah was. He was a very great man. He was a very, very compassionate and righteous man. And of course, he's the, the ancestor, the, he's the patriarch of all humanity, Amen. And what he was up against, he was he was up against a world gone wrong. He was up against a world that had completely s- sunk past all recognition of of the Tzelem Elokim, of the divine image, and it was absolutely unredeemable, which is an incredible thought. This panorama that we're looking at in this parsha that that comes with the flood, the mabul as it's called in, in Hebrew. And the building of the Tower of Babel, which was uh, 340 years after the flood, this uh, this is all rooted in the the disastrous fall that began in in God Eden, when uh, Adam and Eve were tested. They were given boundaries, and those boundaries are what we call laws. Uh, and and of course, in the creation story, uh, you know, they're explicitly told that uh, to to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And that requires a certain level of morality. 
uh, our species would have become extinct if the first couple had decided that they didn't identify as male and female. Ouch. Hello. Look, Adam and Eve were okay. They did their tshuva, Jim. They made, mm-hmm. they made their peace with Hashem. But there was a progression, a downward spiral throughout these few generations. And what happened was, slowly but surely, mankind... It's not that mankind did not believe in Hashem. It's right. that they basically felt that Hashem uh, should be, should I say, seen and not heard? No, not even seen and not heard, but just, okay, he has his place and keep him there. And we don't need him in this world. We don't yeah. need him in this world. And basically mankind decided as a body that it was that it was able to get along without Hashem. It all started actually in um, in chapter four of um of Breshit in the, towards the end of, of the Parsha, in chapter four, we, re, we read a verse, uh, verse 26. And, and as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then to call in the name of Hashem became profaned. In other yeah. words, calling in the name of Hashem became like a, a, an ordinary thing. It, it, it lacked any sense of holiness. It became uh, just absolutely profane. Yeah. And so that was the beginning of, of the end. And then what happens is our sages look at these verses in, in Torah that tell us that, that the, um, the world became completely corrupt and, 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 and the earth was filled with, with violence, and, uh, which is called, by the way, Hamas in Hebrew. Uh, it's a type of um, a mixture of idolatry and terrible, terrible immorality and violent robbery. And Hashem literally regretted making man and the our sages delve into the character of this generation it's really chilling to read their description they they speak of institutionalized depravity basically they speak of um people who actually married animals yeah and drew up and drew up marriage contracts Right. They speak of of designer fashions. They actually, the sages say that that the men and women of that generation designed clothes that exposed their private parts as they were walking through the marketplace. This is where, where they were at, and it and it spiraled down into this place of tremendous, tremendous corruption. And and this is why the whole world had to be destroyed because. You know, a famous question that people ask is, well, if man sinned, what did the animals do wrong? The animals also were killed with the exception of those that were on the ark. And the idea is that man is the maestro of, of all of creation, of all of the universe. And as, as he goes, so too does all of existence go. And so uh, in his um, role as caretaker of the, of the garden, of the world, when he began to uh, discombobulate and unravel and lose and lose everything, so too he had that influence on all of life around him, and the and and all and the entire living world took its cue from the depravity of of man and and joined in and became filled with this terrible, terrible negative spiritual destructive force. Rabbi, don't the sages also sort of suggest that? They even that uh, humanity was even uh, crossbreeding animals across species, and yes. they were they were st- causing these strange mixtures, and that uh, there's even a hint that uh, these uh, strange animals that we see in mythology today, uh, that that is a sort of a residue of, of of what could have taken place before the Mabu, before the flood. Right. Right. So, you know, the, the, the idea is that, again, man is so powerful spiritually and he has such influence over all of creation that when he, when he acts in a certain way, whether it's positive or negative, he, he creates a spiritual being. And you, you know how when, when Cain killed Abel back in, in Brishit, he said, my sin is too great to bear. This is because he began to understand that that his sin was so enormous that it couldn't be rectified. And here too, when we read in our verses that the earth became corrupt and filled with Hamas, the idea is that their terrible actions created spiritual accusers who were associated with these crimes of Hamas, of violent robbery, 
and sexual depravity. And these forces rose before the creator and gave testimony. And that's why, that's what prompted the Holy One, blessed be he, to say to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Yeah. As if to say the accusers that you men have created with your sins have come before me and they demand to, to hasten man's end. That, because man created this death trap for himself. It was like a no-win situation because he had such a tremendous wanton and incontrollable lust for evil itself that the only answer was that it had to be obliterated and, and begun again. You know, we're, we're taught, Rabbi, that if we could uh, see or even uh, we could access the direct presence of Hashem, that, that our free will would be taken away. And I wonder if there isn't a, a sort of a correlation between the idea that with humanity be right before the flood attributed indirectly to Hashem by worshiping all of the agents and all of the forces, that that was a way of hiding Hashem from them so that they could carry on this kind of behavior. It all boils down to free choice that Hashem exactly. deliberately put us in a world where his, where his presence is concealed because he wants us to seek him out. Yeah. But it's just as easy for a person to deny that there is a God in the world altogether or to put him in whatever framework he, he so desires, you know, because it makes him more comfortable, because it makes him more, more uh, you know, able to deal with God. So, so instead of, of, again, instead of God fashioning man in his image, man goes and fashions God in his image. There is this idea in the sages that humanity of the flood era had split the attributes of Hashem. And what they had done is they had gotten to a point that where we see people today, they believed that as long as they were alive, their relationship with God was fine. The whole generation said, I don't believe in a God who would do this or that. And it started it was, out that way. It yeah. started out that way with kind of like with an ideological rationalization yeah. within their comfort zone that this is this is the God that they wanted to believe in. But right. it, it, it started out that way, which almost sounds innocent. But then what happened was they began to become more and more cynical and more and more manipulative. And, and then we have that very chilling statement that our sages make about you know, describing again their their the nature of that generation, talking about how you know Hashem put them in this beautiful world that was absolutely stunning world with everything that they needed, and it was full of such incredible blessing and bounty. And for example, it featured very beautiful water, beautiful mm -hmm. lakes, beautiful streams and rivers. And so the, the midrash, you know, gives us this uh, incredible lesson about this very concept of of uh, of. Um, what a person is capable of in terms of their denial that, that the Midrash says that the people of that generation, they, they believed in Hashem, but they, you know, they, they, they said like, let him stay in his place in his world. And we're in our world. And, and they said, you know, the most that we would ever want from him anyway, is like to give us some water so that our, our things would grow, but we've got plenty of water. So we don't need him, you know, you know, because Hashem always, it administers justice according to the system that we refer to as midah connected midah, which means measure for measure. So since they said the only thing we might ever consider that we might need that fellow for is some some water, some life giving water, but we've got plenty of that. <laughs> Hashem said, "Oh, really? You've got water? Well, I'll show you water. Here's some more water." We can see a direct uh, connection between the people of the the flood generation and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. They they were exactly the same in that they, as you said, they they sort of mandated cruelty and they mandated uh, sin. And they institutionalized it. Institutionalized. It was sponsored. But what I was going to say is also that 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 the uh, the people of Sonoma Gomorrah were living in a very fruitful plain, and they basically were. It was like a. It was like an every it, every day was like a resort to them. They had all the food they needed. They were wealthy f families. For the these cities were were wealthy. They were like like pleasure domes, if you will. And they they finally they ignored God and gave way to depravity, and they're an exact mirror of the flood generation. And look what happened to and, them. And then also in our parsha, I don't want to go out of order here because there's just so much going on that we want to talk about. But after the flood, 
the incident of, of the Tower of Babel, which was also a direct act of rebellion and an attempt to unseat God. So it's this thing that people have about not being able to relinquish authority. But, but getting back to the generation of the flood for a moment, again, the, the, the Midrash, the teachings of our sages tell us about these incredible levels of evil to which the generation of the flood fell. They, again, they talk about this terrible, unspeakable, rampant sexual immorality, which is just the most... It's absolutely unspeakable, the practices of, of the people in, in that generation. And in addition to that, there was this aspect of, of collective communal robbery and exploitation of a person. For example, there's this idea that a Ben Noach is not liable for, uh, legally liable for stealing if he steals a, a, an, an amount that's insignificant, Right. So, so what happened? In, in other words, stealing is one of the seven Noahide laws, as you know. We, this right. is this is a, pr a primary time to talk about the Noahide law, laws. Gentiles are obligated by Torah to fulfill the universal laws, and one of them is against stealing. And they knew that in that generation. So, what did they do? So, the Midrash says, you know what? On a day in which the court was set up in the marketplace, that there was a, there was a court that was sitting to hear people's complaints and cases in a public place a man would set down a, a container, a big barrel full of beans. He's selling beans, right? Selling beans by the, by the kilo, let's say. And then in broad daylight and before the eyes of everyone and before the eyes of the judges, a stream of people would pass by and one by one, each one of them would steal one bean. They, they emptied the container of its contents. They had, this had all been arranged and agreed upon according to a prior plan. So there was conspiratorial complicity between them all. And they all knew that in this manner, they would not be considered liable for stealing and yet according to the law and they could not be legally prosecuted. And yet they absolutely destroyed the livelihood of this person. Yeah. And, 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 and this is just one example. And, and, and then the sages continue and they talk about, you know, again, they talk about more serious offenses, idolatry and murder and the sexual offenses. And they, and basically, they're describing this world in which there was this proliferation of these sins on such a global level that what it demonstrated is that man's evil side had complete and total victory over his godly spiritual uh, soul. And indeed, it seemed that all, all was lost. But the question is, Jim, if, if Hamas means robbery, and we know that there were victims, why was everyone punished? In other words, why were, why were there... The, the victims punished alongside the perpetrators. It's one thing when a, a, a thief shows utter disregard for the laws of God and man, but what crime, what evil did the victims of the, of the theft con commit if they were also deemed worthy of destruction? And this is exactly the lesson of, of this concept of the generation of the flood, that it was the collective death of innocence Right. Altogether, there was no innocent person. There, this was a, it's like every single person alive contributed to evil in their own way. So a person might have gotten robbed, but he contributed in a different way. They were all like some, some participants in some massive global experiment. And the experiment brought forth this shocking, frightening breakthrough, which was the collective death of innocence meaning. And this is where you have to open up your heart in the deeper way, because it sounds very, very harsh, but there simply was no such thing in that generation as someone who was not found guilty. Humanity as a whole was so thoroughly decadent that no one could be considered innocent. And, and, yeah. and this, is, this is why Hashem came to the conclusion that, that he came to. Man was was guilty of, of all of these things to the extent that humanity was actually they were corrupting animals, and it said the very earth itself was corrupt. So they were they were they were destroying God's entire creation, and it, it wasn't you know it wasn't the animals that initiated it. it, you know it was it was humanity of that of that day. And uh, go ahead, I, you, there was ahead. a brief, there was a brief respite. You're right. The earth itself bore the scars. The earth bore the anguish and the pain uh, of the of the collective decay, the rot that was bone deep in creation that man brought. But then there was this interesting respite that Noah brought along. Noah, what does the name mean? It means the rest. The word means, means rest, exactly, which is, rest. which is very beautiful. Now, when he was born, his father said, this one will bring us respite. Respite, right? Yeah. Let's, let's, look at, let's look at the respite. Let's look at the, the verse, right? When Noah was born, 
Lamech lived 182 years and brought, begot a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, this one will bring us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands, from the ground which, has, which Hashem has cursed. What is that all about? So our sages teach us that what happened was, um, from the time that Adam HaRishon had sinned, it's kind of like nature um, rebelled against Adam. Yeah. In other words, Adam and Chava made their tshuva and they made their peace and they had their mission, but but the earth was affected by the by the rebellion at, at the garden, and so and so the midrash states that that uh, the, the the cow the ox would not plow, and and uh, the and the earth would not give way to the scythe and would not would not cooperate and and and. Uh, uh, and until Noah came, there was a, this kind of topsy turviness to creation that they would they would plant you know seeds of wheat and and, and instead uh, thistles would would grow and and when Noah was born, it was like you know like it reminds us of when Moshe was born, like the the the, the room filled up with light. You know when mm-hmm. Noah was born, all of this kind of like um, the world going haywire stopped. And the and the world returned to its natural order, and so they knew that he was born to be a, a, a tzaddik, and also, on, on some level, it has a very deep meaning. Noach is the person, according to the sages, who fashioned farming implements. Yeah, exactly. He, he was he was the first one. It's it's kind of like he was trying to tame the world even before he received his mandate to save the world in the ark. He was he was like single handedly brimming with this righteousness and he was trying to to rein in all of these crazy topsy-turvy forces and and bring the world back to a place where it would be user-friendly yeah and this points to the concept that we've repeated a number of times and i think is worth repeating again is that the, the name of the figures in the torah each each name of the of the personage is a prophecy their name embraces or or uh in embeds a concept of what was going on uh, in their day. When we come along with the generation of dispersion, the figure who is known as um, uh, Feleg. <laughs> Feleg. Right. Yeah, Feleg. Right. Fe- in, in his day is when the earth was divided. Literally, right. the, the peoples divided. And Nimrod, the, the word Nimrod, he was, he was the big bad one. And that right. word literally means let us rebel. Yeah, well, it's where we get the, the English word maraud. Because he was the preeminent marauder of his day, but yes. to get back to to Noah, right, we don't want to stray too far from that particular thing. Uh, can you talk about the 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 kind of controversy that continues to this day as to the righteousness of Noah? This is a famous issue that 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 is um, highlighted because the verse tells us that um, Noah Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generation. Yeah. Noah walked with God. So there are many, many different ways of looking at the verse and commentaries and expositions that that compare him, for example, to Avraham. And they say that he was righteous in his generation, but if you would have put him in the generation of Avraham, then he wouldn't have been so righteous, but that because he was the only one in his generation, he stood out and that kind of thing. But unquestionably, when we look at, at all of the depth of, of the tradition that our sages give over to us, the man was absolutely righteous. And that's all that counts. Everything is always relative, Jim. Everything is always, there's no point in comparing because the whole, the, the, the whole essence of life is that we have to be ourselves. So whatever, whatever that's all about, the, the fact is that Noah was the one that was deemed worthy in Hashem's eyes of trying to save humanity. And he did his best. The sages talk about how he st- he faced down the whole world. You know, he was building this ark for a very long time, right? And he took uh, in tremendous abuse from uh, from from everybody in the generation who basically mocked him and attacked him completely. He was he was seen like some sort of mad prophet of doom. Yeah, and nobody, I'm glad- nobody be- believed him. I'm glad that doesn't happen anymore, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and they were all saying it's fake news. You it's know fake what? news. They were saying, no, oh, this isn't science. Come on, man. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they said, it's science. And they said, they said it's a conspiracy theory and all that kind of thing. But the we, fact is that he, he was right. Not only are, are, are those qualities very redemptive uh, for Noah in Noah's behalf, but you look at what he did after the flood 
Look, look who look what he did with his son Aver. They set up an academy that taught about the one true God. Also, Shem was involved, and all of the patriarchs went and spent years with him, learning about the Creator and learning about Hashem. So, I mean, he even after the flood, even though we don't see him in the text of the Torah, the the oral tradition is full of these stories about Yaakov going and spending time there. Uh, 15 years, I think, and and Avraham, after he had left Ur of Kazdim, and, and and he also spent time. Can you can you just envision that table? You know, Avraham sitting with Shem, and Aver and Noah, and Avraham asking questions. Uh, you know, no wonder the man, uh, you know, was a, a leader of and an innovator. Of a, of a you know a new nation, but the uh, so I'm you know I, I I I tend to agree with you in the fact that I think Noah gets a bad rap. And he does get a bad rap, and 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 the fact is he had a very unenviable job, and the opposition was tremendous. Um, the the fact is it was given over to him to save humanity, and he did. Right. Um, there there is a lot of of um, fine critique you know re regarding he, should he have been more proactive did he did he really um do as much as he could to bring the people in his generation to tshuva uh, or did he or did he merely chastise them you know when when they pass by and then there's the issue of of his prayer you know did he did he actively seek hashem enough to try and cancel the decree did he did he pray all this is the subject of a, a lot of study but again I, I think the main thing for us to understand is that sometimes it's up to one person and whoever that person is this is this is who hashem has in in, in his world amen he was so he was the father of all of all creation at this point of the, of all recreation. You know the famous story about the this particular creature that he didn't know what to feed it. The phoenix. No, not the phoenix. There was a phoenix on the ark. As well, that's one of the that's one of the stories. Is the phoenix basically says, "Don't worry about me. You know, feed the other animals first. And and Noah blessed the animal. And it it uh, in in turn got eternal life or something like that. Really, it's, this yeah, I was not aware it, of. It's a, it's a legend, if you will. That's that's you know told about Noah because it's supposed to point out to the fact you know we I, I talked about the conversations that Abraham had had could have had with Noah. Uh, Noah likely told him the story of when he got he had he had a bad leg. Noah had a bad leg after the flood because, because he would take care to feed the animals before he and his family sat down to eat. He would make sure all the animals had been fed properly, and he wasn't quick enough to feed the lion, and the lion struck him with his paw when he walked by. And the sages tell us that Avram thought with himself, wow, if, if Noah, the man chosen by God, to bring to to restart mankind could could be that kind towards animals how much kinder should i be to human beings and th this instilled the idea and we know that Abraham was known for his his uh, courtesy and his kindness his trait of chesed his trait of kindness right and this the, the the talmud tells us that noah his whole life on the ark was to so totally given over to the survival of of all the creatures that he thought nothing for himself he practically did not sleep or eat because there were creatures that were used to eating at a certain time of day and so around the clock he and his sons they were they were just busy feeding the animals and yeah. day and night day and night this is this is what they did this is all that they were able, that that they were occupied with and there was this one creature that wouldn't eat anything and it started to waste away. And Noah was very, very upset because he had with him on the ark all sorts of provisions for all the different animals. And there was this one animal that uh, I believe actually it, it was a type of salamander or a lizard. And there was nothing that it would that it would eat. And Noah was very, very worried about it. And he was contemplating this and pondering and very, very bothered. And one day he had an apple in his hands and the apple fell and broke open and a little worm came out. And right away, the creature's eyes lit up and went and darted and 
grabbed it. And that's what it ate. That's what it was looking for. Yeah. And from that point on, Noah had a steady supply and let some apples go bad and knew that he was able to feed that animal as well. By the what way, a guy. By the way, I think we should also address the uh, the recent story uh, that has uh, appeared in the worldwide press and even in uh, publications that you wouldn't even think would touch this subject. But you know, they're they're talking about the ark being discovered on on uh, in the in the mountains of Ararat once again. It was in the it was in the news the past couple of weeks, and when I saw the headline, I thought, "Wow, an, an, another new uh, site." And I, I just want to tell our listeners that this site, which is located in eastern Turkey, near, uh, it's in the, the Ararat range. It's it's lower down on, on the mountain. It's near a, a, a town in Turkey called Dubaizet. And the, in fact, it's not a new site. It's a site that was discovered initially in 1959 by a Turkish uh, army captain. And it's been photographed by, I think you could even see it possibly on Google Earth. And it is boat shaped. And what they have done is they've gone to, it's not a new site. They've gone and they've taken new technology and gone back to the site. And my, my uh, teacher, beloved memory, Vendel, has, had been to that same site uh, years ago with uh, a gentleman by the name of David Fasold who wrote about uh, uh, taking a team and scanning the site and looking for materials. And they have since done a new scan using, uh, I think, uh, uh, ground penetrating radar. And the remains seem to be underneath the site, they're, they're saying. So it's it's gotten renewed interest. But what the reason I brought it up is because it's very interesting in that the site, uh, the, if you talk to the natives there in eastern Turkey, the, the, the people who live there, they will tell you that that site was exposed by an earthquake. Uh, they, in fact, a, a series of earthquakes, uh, seismic events occurred, and, and it sort of, uh, as will happen sometimes in an earthquake, this whole section of ground was, was actually thrown up and revealed. What's very interesting about that, whether it's a site, the site or not, I don't know. But what's interesting about it is that the date that is given to when that earthquake occurred is the day before the nation of Israel was was uh, declared as as a, a solemn, a, 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 an actual the state, state. The, the state of Israel. The, it happened. The earthquake was supposed to have happened on May 14th of 1948. And Israel was declared a state the next day, it, May fifteenth, nineteen forty-eight. So it's it's an interesting thing. I don't know whether it's the real side or not. Are you trying to say that the Jews made that earthquake? <laughs> no, I think, I'm sure that there there's plenty of people that are going to say that because they say we control the weather and everything. You know, we do this, yeah. we do that. Actually, the Mossad's very good at that right now. They they often say you know that they'll claim and they're 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 wonderfully funny. Uh, Twitter feed that yeah yeah that was our weather machine that did that and whether they're really the Mossad or not I don't know a quick thing about the ark itself which is very the teva two things I'd like you to uh, kind of explore with me and that is that the dimensions of uh, thirty amot in height three hundred amot in length and fifty amot in width and what's really uh, I think notable is the the height and the length are a d direct 10 to 1 ratio of proportion and some of the sages draw from this the fact that this this uh these uh proportions 10 to 1 are perfect for a vessel uh, not a boat because the because the ark was not a boat it, they, they couldn't steer it but it had to have tremendous stability to survive the the roiling waters of the of the flood be, of being tossed around and they have this wonderful they say even the ark itself is a lesson that the 10 to 1 ratio is the 10 are the 10 uh, utterances of creation the first 10 commandments and the one of course is the one true god so for uh god's people there is the idea that the 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 torah and the one God is a uh, a recipe for a stable life, for stability in your life. 
And the Ark itself was like a manifestation of faith, really. That's that was the idea of going into the Ark, and and it's it's kind of like the sukkah. You know, yeah. you're in the sukkah, and yeah. you're being buffeted by winds, and the and it rains, and the elements can get in, and you're stable. You're yeah. in stable condition because this is our situation in in the world, and that was part of Noah's test also of, of coming into the Ark. And the other, you know, that, that you know, you know that the sages tell us. I, I know you and I have spoken about this. That in that in the in the time when it all starts to fall apart, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, is going to be the Noah's Ark of the whole world. Right. And yeah. that, and that the sages teach us that in the time of the great flood, the flood waters did not affect the land of Israel. Yeah. And so too in the future, this is going to be the place of stability. This is going to be the um escape escape route as it would be for the for in in the in that great upheaval yeah and there's a link there is a there is a verse that links those two concepts together and that is it, that in the in Brashid, in the book of genesis the verse that tells us that noah went into the ark the same day that the flood waters began the the hebrew phrase means right. on the self same day it's actually verse verse 13 in chapter 7 on the on that very day yeah. noah came into the ark just prior to their going into the land this this ark like land uh, that same phrase is used to say that uh, he went to uh, his place of rest should we talk about the Sheva Mitzvot since I'm a Noahide? Oh, I actually think that's that's so apropos because, again, I mean, if not now, when, Jim, the fact is that <laughs> that that, the, that this Torah portion, and again, just the whole the whole timing here, the whole synchronicity of everything that we're going through as people in our world, all, all of us now, we just finished the the, the wrenching, tremendously tremendously uh, arrestive and 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 um you know powerful experience of, of the Tishrei holidays and we and we we have this new and and really like um heightened awareness of our relationship with Hashem. Then we come into the month of Marcheshvan, which again is like it's low key. We're bringing everything inside and we it's kind of like proving if we really did make the grid, if we really did acquire these ideas on a soul level, then that's what the month of Marcheshvan is is kind of all about. And again, it's this this is time of of water is this time of the of the rains of blessing and at the same time in the backstory is that this is the time of the flood and then we we learn all about what went wrong with the world at this time and again these 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 just staggering and shocking and horrific depictions of the level that humanity descended to in the time of the flood and again if we fast forward there's just so many bad things going on in the world today noah is the patriarch of the world as as it is and the seven laws are called on his name right yeah and they were ratified in in his time like and, and and it's the understanding of of the torah sages that the entire human race is responsible for these seven universal laws which basically are prohibitions against all of those things that led to the destruction of the world exactly in the time of Noah, because they are prohibitions against idolatry and against cursing Hashem. And, and it's about believing in Hashem and it's about not murdering and it's about not engaging in illicit sexual relations. And it's about respecting all of, of, of um, creation, all of life. And it's about establishing justice, a system of justice and to make, to make sure that the crime does not continue. And so, it's so, it's so connected because that is the secret that the, you know, there's Noah, he represents the bedrock of the survival of the human race. These seven laws are about the survival of the human race. The seven laws are uh, against idolatry, against blasphemy, against sexual immorality, uh, against theft, against murder, and then a positive commandment, which is to establish uh, courts of justice. And the, uh, the seventh commandment, was was said to be added after the flood and this is when noah and his family they they uh descend from the ark they they exit the ark and what's very interesting to me is the fact that two things point directly i think to this the sheva mitzvot the seven laws of noah one is the fact that god puts a rainbow in in the clouds and said this is a sign of my covenant Okay, what covenant is he talking about? He's there's an exact covenant there, 
And the idea is, is that he would no longer, he would never again flood the world uh, in a flood of waters. And there are, there, by the way, there are seven colors in the rainbow. But an, another significant uh, uh, aspect of there being seven laws for humanity is the fact that when you read the Parsha of Noah, the word covenant itself, the word Brit, is it shows up exactly seven times. But as you just said, the the uh, the the sages tell us that yes, they're not written directly as we just uh, read them, but they are there are de- they're definitely referenced in the ideas, as you said, of everything that that people had done against God that led up to the flood. You have uh, the ideas against idolatry and against blasphemy. That actually began in Gan Eden. If questioning God wasn't wrong, why were Adam and Eve expelled from the garden? If theft was was not wrong, then why? The truth is that their crime was a crime of, of theft, th- of theft, they theft. As, well as, a, as well as a crime of blasphemy and idolatry, and, really. And exactly. The com- commentaries expand on the text. And they they reveal that they got out of the ark. There was a restatement of these laws. He makes a brit, the covenant with Noah and his descendants, and the concepts are restated, beginning with a new commandment, which is which is we call uh, in Hebrew ever min chai, eating the limb of a living animal, and that is found in Genesis nine four. But the flesh with its soul, its blood, you shall not eat. And the concept of courts of justice and capital punishment is also restated in uh, 9.6. Whoso sheddeth the blood of man, by by man shall his blood be shed for the image of God made he man. So the idea is is that God says, I'm going to put into your hands mankind. You will be responsible for adjudicating these laws that men have broken in your own courts. The seven laws are very often erroneously referred to as Judaism for Gentiles. Right. But what they re- what they really are is that they are like a a um, succinct redaction, uh, a, a a a capitalization of the entire Torah for the whole world. Yes, exactly. It's like it's like the, it's like the the major framework of belief in Hashem without being responsible for all 613 commandments, this is the Torah for the whole world. And and the truth is that they are an outline. They are a framework. And there are many, many righteous Gentiles who seek to do more of Torah and and all power to them. They certainly are are entitled to do that. That's what we're all about. But the idea is that without these seven basic laws, all of humanity disintegrates. Yeah. And the difference is I want people to, I don't know if we can even restate this enough and that is the idea is that there is a there is a covenant for humanity and there's a covenant between there, there's, there's a covenant between God and humanity and it's it's the covenant made with Noah and then there's the covenant he made at Sinai which is with a nation he created with a specific goal their if you will their mission is to is to be a priesthood to humanity, to the whole world. so if you, so you, uh, a, a non-Jew has a relationship with God already through the covenant with Noah. But if, of if course, you, that that covenant preceded Israel's covenant. Exactly. That was the first covenant in history. Is that Hashem has a binding relationship with all of humanity? But note, Jim, note as a, as as a lot of people object to this because they like to just do things at, at, at their own speed at their own pace and according to their own judgment but the fact is the brits the covenant the relationship is based on action yes it's based on on hashem's will it's based on on something experiential it's based on doing it's not it's not a philosophy it's about doing the right thing. Yeah. You can sit in a cave. I say this often. You can sit in a cave all day long and you can think good thoughts. And if that's all you do, that doesn't make you a good person. Good people do good things. And and that that was echoed uh, dramatically at Sinai when the nation of Israel was given the Torah, given their set of laws for their nation as a priesthood. And they said, we will do and we will hear. And you know why it's not sufficient for a person just to not do anything bad and to think good thoughts? 
and let's say you have a person who is what they call an ivory tower, you know, and, and is, is actually involved in all sorts of deep, deep contemplation all day and, and, um, and not part of the world. You know, the Torah is very much against that kind of asceticism, against being a hermit. The Torah is very much about being part of society. And so many of the laws of Torah are about a, a society, a proper functioning society. And the thing is, it's very simple and very deep at the same time, that if a person is isolated and just thinking good thoughts all day, it doesn't mean that they're righteous. It just means that they've never been tested. Yeah. Exactly. But we don't know how, how that person would, would react if they were called to task, if they had to face down a test. That's what it really means to become a, a human being. To, yeah. it, it means to be able to rise to the occasion uh, and to the challenge that Hashem places in front of us. Yeah. Yeah, they haven't wrestled with that particular angel, so to speak, in, in their exactly. life. Yeah. Exactly. So do we... Do we have time to talk about uh, that rascal Nimrod, or should we explore? Well, that, that, that's the thing about all of this that you know that that we have these cycles in in Torah, right? Yeah. Again, it's just it's just the speed is mind boggling as we are learning these Torah portions. I feel every year I just feel so inadequate. I want to spend so much more time discussing these things. It's a lifetime of study. What's going on in front of us? But okay, Hashem created the world. He liked it. Adam messed it up. And we come 10 generations down the road and, and Noah is going to be instrumental in saving all of humanity because man keeps on veering off target, keeps on trying to departmentalize creation and put Hashem in his little niche and then just take over. Okay, so the flood ostensibly was supposed to have uh, taken care of that. But then we have the birth of Nimrod in chapter 10 of our portion, Nimrod is the first to be a mighty man on earth. He was a mighty hunter before Hashem. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before Hashem. In our Zoom classes over the past year, we had we had a whole series on uh, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. And then we also learned about Yaakov and Esau, and we learned about the, the garment um, of that Nimrod had which gave him certain kind of uh, powers, manipulative powers over, over creation, what that represents exactly. And Nimrod was basically the first spin master. Yeah. He was, he, Politician. He, he, he was the first to be a mighty man on earth, the Torah says, because he was the first self-declared king. Yeah. He was, he was a, a, a very uh, powerful manipulator. Uh, of, that's what he did. He is a fulfillment of the prophecy given by Noah when Noah woke up from being found uncovered in his tent by Ham and his son Canaan. And they had, they had actually, according to the sages, they'd actually tried to uh, mutilate his genitals so that he would have no more offspring and so that the, uh, the, the world would, would not be divided up by, by more descendants of Noah. So you have that aspect. And of course, Noah wakes up and he says, Canaan is basically cursed. He has, he has, look at what his father has created in him and instilled in him. And he is going to be a, what is it? A slave of slaves. And so you have that aspect. Nimrod was descended from Ham. He basically enslaves people. He's enslaved to his passions. And the other thing that shows you how, how that seed, that idea was reinstated in the world is the fact that his own strength and his own uh, self-imposed royalty and cultic worship was the benefit of some garments that were the result of theft. The garments that he wore were, were from Adam and Eve exactly. and were, were stolen by, by Ham and given to eventually given to his what I guess grandson or great grandson Nimrod, I believe. But but again, when we when we talk about the speed in which things are happening and the theme that's being revisited and the um, the issues that man is grappling with, it's it's hard to believe that a generation after the flood and the earth was healing and repopulating, that under Nimrod's um, direction. 
here, here they're they're trying it again in a different way. But this time, they're. It sounds like they're nice people. Like they're united. They have one language and one common purpose. But that common purpose was basically to unseat Hashem, as it were. And this is the the, the whole secret of the tower, the dark tower. Let's call it. Is that it's actually like the mirror image, the evil twinner the negative image of the Beit HaMikdash, of the Holy Temple. Yeah. It was like a temple to anarchy and to, and to um, destruction is, yeah. is really what it was. Well, it was, a temple, it was a temple to humanism. It was the idea that we don't need God, yet they, they, they realized there was a God, but, and the, the three, there were three agendas at work. There were three different types of groups that said, let's build the tower. And they were, they were represented. Even today we see them. And back then they, it, it was government, it was uh, religion, and it was science. And there's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with those three unless they are, uh, void of a belief in the creator. There's nothing wrong with it unless the government is trying to convince you that science is religion. Well, yeah. And, and here's, here's an interesting thing what, that happened is it wasn't so much that they literally couldn't understand each other that eventually dispersed them and brought down the tower. The reason that they couldn't communicate with each other is because they began to, it was when semantics actually got in the way and what God, how God confused them is that he allowed them to embrace their own concepts of what words meant. And so when one guy said, um, you know, listen, hand me that brick. The other guy thought, well, I know what a brick is. And, and he handed him something else like a trowel. And even in the, even in the worst thing, he said, who's that coworker beside you? Oh, it's uh, it's the, the woman I call my wife. And the guy would say to him, uh, we don't call uh, other people women because we don't recognize difference in sexes. We're, we're, uh, we're a transformative people. So uh, what I'm alluding to in a, in a not that sounds very, very, very familiar, not very delicate way is that we have people standing in Congress and telling our government that you can't call uh, you can't call pregnant uh, women, women. You have to call them pregnant people now because somehow They've changed science again because of their own agendas. And I'm probably not being very, uh, you know, delicate about this, but I mean. No, you're not, Jim. You're not, Jim. We might be losing a lot of listeners. So <laughs> let me just say that I, too, am pregnant ah, with, with an idea. With an idea. With an idea. And the idea which, with, with which I feel filled is that I want to give some take home to our listeners now about this beautiful month of Mar Cheshvan, this challenging time. Uh, something to take home and consider. And that is um, that it is a time for really, really inner spiritual work and personal transformation. That's our main focus during this month, because we are really trying to take all the things that we worked on so diligently and so intensely during the month of Tishrei, and we're trying to make sure that that really became part of our being. And so this month is about... Um, inner movement and, and guidance. And I think it's very apropos that the first Torah portion that we read during this new month is the portion of Noah, which is all about Noah building the ark for protection from the upcoming floods of destruction, because we're all facing this in, in, in our time as well. And it's, it's all about mirroring, mirroring the positive words of Noah, his compassion and his desire to be the vessel for Hashem's saving the world. And all of us have challenges in, in our lives that come to the forefront also during this time of year. And it's all about identifying with our higher self and the mission that we're all on and, and uh, going forward with it. So it's a, it's really, it's a, it's a time of transformation in, in its, in its own way. Can I share a couple of things with you before we wrap up that I that I'm just bursting to share with you, and that is first of all the the the, the idea the reason I say that there were three philosophies is I noticed in in tap, chapter ten that Nimrod is called mighty three different times, and I believe that is that that 
as a reflection of the three agendas that fueled uh, his leading to, to people to build the tower. And I have to read something that was written back in the 1800s on on this Parsha that ends up with Nimrod that, that seems like it was written just this week. And this is the great rabbi, Raphael Sampson Hirsch, and he explains what happened to the tower and why people gave themselves over to a leader like Nimrod. And Rabbi Hirsch said, there are nations that avoid thinking for themselves and unload their concerns onto the head of a, of a king. This occurs particularly in nations where the citizens are busily preoccupied with themselves, people who pursue comfort and wealth and ignore the idealistic interest of their community and are ready to sacrifice their own rights and assets so long as they are excused from thinking. We have Avram comes along after Nimrod, and, and he's the antidote to all of this that happens at the tower. It's amazing how he suddenly introduced at the end of our portion. That's something that we we can begin to speak about uh, next week with Hashem's help. So may we have a beautiful first week of this month of Mar Cheshvan. May it be full of rains of blessing, not rains of floods. And may we truly continue to develop all the wonderful decisions and and resolutions and tshuva and prayers that we initiated during the month of Tishrei, we, we really bring them to the forefront of fruition during this month of Mar Cheshvan, month of blessing. Amen. Amen. <laughs>